you're going to see me chatting with Annette Hill. She's a professor of media and communication at Lund University here in Sweden and a visiting professor at King's College in London, UK. Her research focuses on audience and popular culture with interests in media engagement, everyday life, genres, production studies, and culture of cultures of viewing. She is the author of eight books and many articles and book chapters in journals and edited collections, which addresses varieties of engagement with reality television, news and documentary, television drama, entertainment formats, live ev events, and sports entertainment, film violence, and media ethics. She is amazing, and I am really glad that I am having this opportunity to actually chat with her. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation, and I'll see you later. So, Annette, first of all, thank you so much for your kindness to actually talk to me um, about your research and your fields of interest. Is. I'm really, really excited to have this moment with you. And I, I talked to some of my, my colleagues in Brazil uh, that make uh, that we are from the same um, year of the PhD and also uh, from research groups and stuff. And people are very excited to hear you a little bit more. So I will share with them the, the link of this interview. So thank you also for letting me record it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And uh, I, I um, say greetings to um, anyone that's watching this video. And thank you very much for being interested in the kind of research we do on reality television and engagement. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I was I, I made some questions, you know, I, I already sent you um, basically five ground questions that I, I believe are important for us to discuss. Um, but feel like really free to comment on anything you think it may be interesting to put some thoughts or, or maybe um, some advices of, of a research. I don't know, you feel free for that. So uh, the first question is, what made you understand engagement as a spectrum and not simply as a yes or no circumstance? Mm, that's a really good question, Anna. Um, and I guess it kind of, it goes back in time a little bit to ways that I started to look at engagement in a bit more detail. And I think as an audience researcher, it's, it's impossible not to deal with engagement. It's a major, major component of any type of audience research. But I had used it, I think, in the past more in a kind of a single mode of critical engagement. And a lot of the work that I'd done in the Restyling Factuality um, book which was kind of, you know, sort of 2003, 2004, 2005, was about critical engagement with different types of factuality from news to documentary to lifestyle to reality television. And I guess that started an obsession with engagement as, like, as, as really being something that's absolutely central to the type of research I do. And the work that you're referring to recently was my way of expanding what... I define as engagement and how I use it empirically, um, both within a production setting within media industries research and also within audience research. So I'd started to kind of expand what the meaning of engagement is in those two different sectors, if you like. And the, the, the crucial thing I, I understood, and this was a light bulb moment uh, when I was started to talk to different academics like John Corner or, J.K. Hermes or Peter Dahlgren and when I started to talk to industry people, really talented industry people like Douglas Wood or Julie Donovan, um, and I, I realized that engagement's relational. And that was the fundamental, simple light bulb moment for me, that it's relational and that's super important because it's about power. It's about power relations. And there's a, a classic book that's been a, a real um, source of inspiration for many people in cultural geography by Doreen Massey, which is about space. And she argues that space is relational and that we have differential relationships to space. We have differential opportunities and capacities to move, to move around space, to be stuck in certain types of spaces. And she introduced, of course, the, the a, a power, you know, the power question, the question of power within cultural geography and within space and place. And I feel that this is absolutely essential to engagement, to media engagement. 
and it's it's not that scholars haven't done it before i mean if we read some of that brilliant work by peter dalgren and john corner and yoke hermes and those are three i can think of off the top of my head really important works where they've been exploring engagement or engagement with popular culture engagement with political culture they've started to express it as parameters or stages or intensities but now i think you know, we're, we're all really trying to get a, a language for engagement, which is that it's relational. And that's my mission now <laughs> is to is to kind of outline that a lot more. How is engagement relational? Well, a spectrum of engagement starts for you, know, to, for you to see as a researcher how you might theorize it as relational. So the spectrum implies a, a range of relationships we can make and break with um, media in, in this, you know, in my case, drama or reality television, so popular media. Um, and a spectrum also implies that we, we shift our positionings um, across this spectrum. Um, and it also allows me to kind of open up the meaning of engagement as relational when we, we, we lose that contact with a particular media artifact or, or content. So when we break the relationship, when we disengage, so it allowed me to kind of open up um, all those different types of engagement from before it to the moment of engagement itself to kind of afterwards and the consequences of our engagement. So all of that has led me to kind of use the term spectrum, which is really my way of saying that we have a, 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 a sort of protean, a shifting, changing relationship with, with media. And th that's what engagement means to me. And then that opens up all the classic questions around identities and around uh, questions of power. A long answer, but I've, I've, I've tried to encapsulate about 20 years of thinking about the Blimmin concept no, <laughs> in, I, that, in, a, in, a, in that kind of uh, why I think engagement is relational and uh, mm -hmm. why I think it's really important that we, we spend some time defining it, theorizing it and researching it a bit more as relational. Yeah. It is really interesting that you, you go um, and you talk about space uh, through, you know, the, through this idea of something that is relational, because it's exactly what I am doing in my, in my research. So I'm really glad that then I, I am actually doing something that goes around what you already did and some of all the other uh, scholars have already uh, done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm 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 really excited too. How do you see space as relational in your work? Well, I've been working through experience and through memory, so I'm actually um, understanding space as a place um, and also as a territory mm -hmm. from the the ideas of the Lives and Guthrie, and mm -hmm. I'm articulating this to the idea that uh, those spaces they actually. Um, make uh, transmedia dynamics be sustainable mm -hmm. because they uh, encapsulate all sorts of experiences of different experiences and, mm -hmm. and those experiences go pass through the engagement because they, like you said, they shift, they uh, change throughout our story. So um, maybe when we go to those theme parks, when we are kids, we will have a, a kind of relation with that. But when we go mm. as a parent, we will have another uh, uh, life or another experience through that space. So I'm working with these mm -hmm. ideas. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm really excited that you actually quoted uh, the, the, the idea of space also being relational because it's one of my main points in my, my research. Good, so, good. Well, we're thinking along the same lines then. Yes, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> my second question is, what is the difference between the embedded engagement and fun relationship with a certain media content? Yeah. I mean, fan engagement and embedded engagement do cross over. I mean, there's clear um, entanglements between fan studies when you look at intense types of fan engagement. And what I'm what I've been talking about is embedded engagement. Um, and I and I think it's uh, it's exciting to look at the 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 connections. So in no way are they separate. Mm -hmm. I think there's a kind of messy crossing over 
um, between fan engagement and embedded engagement, absolutely. And a lot of that, of course, is, is contingent on how someone identifies themselves. So if they identify themselves as a fan, then when they're talking about their intensity of engagement, their passionate engagement, or their anti-fandom, so their negative engagement, um, then uh, you know we, we take that with the fan identity and all the kind of literature and theorizing around fandom, mm -hmm. which is so interesting. Um, and for me, embedded engagement is more than fan engagement. So you can be a fan and you can engage passionately, positively or negatively with your object of fandom. But embedded engagement is absolutely bringing in the, the notion of time. So it, it, it really brings in the temporal relationship of engagement. And that's absolutely cr crucial. So, uh, and you can be an, uh, an audience member and you can be a fan and still have embedded engagement. You don't have to identify as a fandom to have embedded engagement. Um, but embedded engagement is absolutely when um, we're talking about um, audiences and fans making a long-term commitment to their kind of object <laughs> of fandom or their artifact or, or, or content that they're engaging with. And they're making that temporal commitment and seeing it as a kind of a, an investment, you know, a real investment, personal investment or a, or a sort of um, more kind of social, social, size, social type of investment in that sort of popular culture. And it's a, it, it can be uh, a notion of time, which is that you're embedding in something for a whole season until that season's finished. Or it can be that you keep coming back to the returning season. So year in and year out, you'll keep returning to that, that, um, that TV series or that, um, that particular kind of celebrity. And you'll, 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 you'll be kind of temporally engaging with them on a, on a kind of long-term basis. But it also takes into account when you have a temporal relationship with something where it's absolutely embedded in your daily life so that you it, it, you, you can also incorporate it constantly into your kind of um, mundane routines so it tries to get at all the different temporal relationships we have with something but we we know we know we're engaging with uh, an artifact or a, or a tv series or, or something from popular culture which is going to take a lot of our time and we we give it we give that time up you know we don't go oh man i don't know if i want to commit to this series you know <laughs> i've watched the first episode i'm out that is an embedded engagement it's really kind of seeing okay i'm taking i'm, I'm watching lucifer and i'm going to go through all the seasons <laughs> right the way <laughs> to now you know uh, even if there's some dodgy moments and some things where things aren't quite you know happening i'm, I'm going to stay embedded in my engagement with that kind of series right the way through i think that one of the funniest examples which we've seen a lot of people research at the moment is Game of Thrones, where where, where people were in, had embedded engagement with that that's that um, transmedia story world right the way through to the bitter end. Um, and of course, you could be a fan or you could be a, um, a an audience, but nevertheless, that was a kind of real embedded engagement um, mm -hmm. through to a kind of ultimate sense of disappointment. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. you know, that, that's, but that that involved a, a serious commitment of time, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there is uh, some some research, new research from uh, Susanna Tosca in Lisbeth Kostrup from um, Denmark, Denmark, and they comment on how different generations understand those uh, this idea of being a fan of something. Like mm -hmm. uh, they are noticing that the people who were born after the the two thousands that they actually are more uh, they, they don't. They, they don't feel the need to consider themselves as fans, or sometimes they are more free to, to the use of this word because they are exposed to so many kinds of different media throughout their lives that they don't feel the need to actually um, use some identifiers um, through mm -hmm. media, you know, like they, they kind of engage with different things and they, they are very um, organically uh, retained by something or not, and they are okay mm -hmm. with that. So mm -hmm. maybe there, this, there is also, I think, some, some kind of generational um, differences that we may have to look through in the couple of next years. Well, 
Well, let's unpack that a bit. What kind of research did they do? I mean, I know those authors from Denmark. They do some really interesting work on fandom and and um, yes, yes. fan cultures. So, I mean, terrific, um, terrific work. What was the empirical we- research they were referring to? It's just like a, a, a note that they do um, in the seventh uh, in the seventh chapter, which is called Lifetime. And mm-hmm. in this paper, they they have interviewed a lot of people, and. Um, well, but for lots of people. Oh, well, uh, uh, then you, you got me. I don't know how many, but they spent 15 years <laughs> researching all different of, uh, all different of uh, places. They, they tell that they uh, did some online research, that they did um, snowballing uh, research, that they um, put some surveys uh, on, um, on events, international events of culture mm. of fan culture and things like that so they actually mm. made this uh, huge amount of, of work and uh, they try their best to actually speak with different generations people from different ages yeah. and um, and they yeah. make them feel like um what is a transmedia word for you like uh, what do you consider and they made this like free um approach so they so the mm. people can actually mm. you know um speak their minds and what they consider to be a transmedia work so it's it's a really interesting work mm. and this made me think when you you talked about this identity how we perceive ourselves as fans fans of something and how this yeah. may be changing i mean absolutely i mean I, I think that's interesting to look at different generations um and uh i mean i'm thinking about some recent research um that I was involved with, which was studying Generation Z and millennials for streaming entertainment platforms Mm -hmm. um, in the four Nordic regions. And I would say that people were very, very articulate about their fandom. So I don't know if something's changed in the COVID-19 context. Um, Yeah, I don't know. So they were, they were very, um, um, articulate about about mm-hmm. fandom you know yeah. uh, I mean I think I think fandom scholars have always shown um that there's a kind of an unnecessary stigma around it mm-hmm. and certainly maybe the, maybe maybe um these scholars are suggesting that stigma's passed that that's maybe that stigma is kind of for an older generation that sort of mm-hmm. grew up with that sort of stigma from the 70s 80s 90s around kind of passionate fandom and mm-hmm. mythology of fandom you know those kinds of things that we'd see in the popular press yes. maybe they're saying that kind of gen z um, uh, millennials don't feel that s- stigmatization in any way as a framing device for for their kind of um um you know engagement but uh in this kind of research that I, I did in december um in this research i did in december it was striking in the in the pandemic period across the mm-hmm. four nordic countries that um people were had time to invest in fandom yes. because you know they're yeah stuck mm-hmm. um pretty pretty kind of immobile as you as you know um yeah. in these kind of current um current uh COVID-19 context and maybe that's there's a kind of reassessment for Gen Z for example you know yeah. around what, what fandom is to them and whether, whether they whether that's important to them what kind of time investment they want to make in that mm-hmm, fandom mm-hmm. how they want to share that identity as fans or not well interest very interesting isn't it shifting yes, identity. It is. yeah Th- there is something interesting also in in the research of this these two authors is that uh they try their best to actually speak with people that that are not part of that prosumer uh, mm-hmm. idea of fandom, you know, like those people that actually write fan fictions, that goes to yeah. cosplay events, yeah. and things like that. So uh, yeah. maybe this this difference of of how they perceive themselves goes through that also, you know, like yes. uh, you can also have graduate grad, gradations of fandom. Like uh, yeah. I think we spent so many times talking about uh, this hardcore fan that actually like lives through the media, the, the media content. And we forget mm-hmm. that there are a lot of different 
there is a spectrum of fandom also i believe i don't know <laughs> absolutely and it's uh, intensely hierarchical right how did you identify uh, that they were talking about a sort of embedded engagement uh, was it a set of expressions their uh, how they perceive their affection their body language i don't know how how was uh, for you to actually see that and say okay that's about embedded engagement for that particular case study, we did this multi-site um, mm -hmm. qualitative research. So we were, uh, it was myself and a team of really talented assistants who were working with me and a, and a kind of industry consultant that was working with me. And we went in into the actual production company and sort of spent time with them through the auditions they were doing in a theatre in London, right through to a kind of the big events that they ran at, in, in Earl's Court in London. Um, and we did a combination of sort of uh, interviews with the producers and the, and the contestants and the families of the contestants um, alongside the kind of the live audiences. And then we followed up with some kind of at home audiences, kind of go along interviews with sort of audiences at home as well who were watching the live events in their living rooms. So I think the, the, the multi-site um, types of audience, the audience research we did really allowed us to see where the temporal relationship was coming out strongly in their engagement with Got To Dance. And what we found was, um, for example, uh, it, this and this was very easy to see, um, you, you would be talking to contestants at, at the auditions who were coming along, and they had a big set of family supporters and friends who were, who were there with them. Quite often those contestants were part of a dance school or to a local dance community of some kind. So they had a big kind of network of, of supporters and some of them might have just helped them get to the audition site and others were kind of hanging out with them and waiting right for them in, in the corridors and the, and the, the sort of outside the venue and, and would go into the, the, the theatre space to kind of be the live audience for the audition. And it was really obvious that they auditioned year on year you know they prepared to audition year on year because this was the like a national show it was its fifth year fifth season and all the local dance communities uh, as well as amateur dancers and, and kind of semi-professional dance schools went to this show you know so it was it was very obvious to us that that they were they were embedding uh, you know, um, themselves and making a kind of a year-on-year -year commitment to the show. Whether they got through the auditions or not, whether they were just supporters in the background or not, they would watch the show and vote in the show and kind of, some of them said they were fans of it and some of them said they, they weren't, they were just, you know, they were just audiences, but they were there to support their dancers. And that, that was very obvious then that we were talking about something that was embedded. It was embedded in the local communities, for example. So, so, you know, I remember one really vivid interview we did, um, and it was myself and, and my researcher, Coco Kondo. We were outside the tube station at Earl's Court, um, and we'd been hanging out there all morning. It was raining, and uh, <laughs> the show didn't start till the evening, right? But people came very early, um, and we were just hanging out and sort of taking taking cover from the rain. And this, this teacher came up to us and we were just chatting away and she's like, oh, I'm just waiting for the bus to arrive with all these school kids from my school and we're all going to go and, you know, watch Got To Dance. And none of them were competing. These were kids that were like five, six years old, right? Mm -hmm. And as we sort of stood chatting to her, along came some of the other kids that had arrived not come with the bus and so maybe their, their, their parents had taken them and you know it was a kind of real sort of family thing and they were all really excited it's like wow you know we watch this every year um we're really committed to this we're so excited to be because this is the first time they were going to see it live and so they you know we, we saw the embedded engagement of course in how they talked to us about it how they reflected on the kind of um yearly commitment they made to the to the series this was the year they decided to come and be a live audience. So kind of, you could see them embedding themselves in the production, right? You know, in some way. And then these kids who were five or six just started singing and dancing. So that, you know, you saw this kind of embodied engagement come out very clearly. And then, you know, we all pretended to be the judges, <laughs> you know, and we're all just standing in this awning by Earl's Court tube station on the street, you know, but we all, um, were able to share the same language, the same, you know, same body movements. I mean, they were all doing street dance because this show is famous for street dancing. 
it was really lovely to see, very kind of positive. Um, but uh, even those kind of five, six year olds had their routines down and they knew what they, they knew, they knew in order to maybe be a contestant in the future. Um, they they needed to kind of embed themselves in 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 the in from inside the production. So they were there to kind of learn how do these other contestants get through the auditions or get through to the live finals. How do they become, you know, um, both reality TV stars but also dancers? Right? They were interested in both things, and so that was fascinating to me. And they were really, you know, and it was embedded in the in the schools. So the schools. You know, the teachers were using Got to Dance as a pro-social way of teaching about commitment and passion <laughs> for your kind of you know lifestyle choices and how important dance is as a kind of you know bodily form of participation. And um, you know, you can really see it embedded everywhere. It was a it was a really interesting kind of um socializing around the show mm -hmm. within sort of communities and sort of um local areas across the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, I was thinking a lot about that because, as you know, I'm relating in your idea of embedded engagement with uh, memory, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I also see a lot of that. I, I work as a guide, a Disney guide. I think I, I commented that with you, and I I saw that year by year you know like this, this this memory thing that they have with with the brands with the stories the childhood and i i think this is one of the 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 points of contact when we talk about how to identify and how to understand the embedded engagement and that's exactly my my fourth question <laughs> for you uh, is how do you relate uh, embedded engagement and memory Mm, well, I didn't, so I'm very keen to see how you would do it in your research, because I think that's a really great question. I, I mean, I guess um, because of the temporal relationship, you've got something very interesting to sort of consider there in, yeah. um, in our memories for a particular artifact, a particular event, a particular brand. So in your case, a kind of a brand as well as a kind of a, a live event <laughs> which you participate in and then that becomes part of your kind of experience of, mm -hmm. of, of Disney so really interesting all around there um I mean I think uh the if we go back to the sort of got to dance case which made me unpack time as a kind of factor in in engagement uh I think the show had developed a kind of a, a really important pro-social brand, which had taken five years to build. So it, it, if we had done that research in, in season two or even season three, I don't think we would have had the adults and children talking about the value of their engagement with the with the with the brand in the same way i think it took until that kind of fourth or fifth season to really kind of um d cultivate that sort of pro social um 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 engagement with the with the got to dance and, and got to dance was is a is an entirely commercial talent show on a commercial subscription service so for people to describe it in such a pro-social way um that that was something that was something that could only come over time you know where you were talking about the series outside of its original transmission period so you would have a memory of when got to dance came to your area to audition because it went around the different regions right so it would go to wales it would go to scotland it would go to northern ireland and this is the fifth year, if you like, that it would have traveled to these to these local areas and people would have this memory of it, you know, of, of auditioning the previous year or going to support your sister that went to audition this year. And I think it became part of kind of families memories of 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 um, the show arriving in their region <clears throat> and then, you know, school memories because schools back the show. So they would, you know, pause for students who were auditioning for the show, they would pause their examinations and the whole school would vote, right? The whole school would get behind 
And I think that became part of the kind of local, very local memory cultures, definitely. Um, and then the series itself, I think if it, it was cancelled at that fifth season for economic um, reasons, and I think if it had carried on, and we were now talking about its 10th season, not its fifth season, but its 10th season, it would be in a broader sort of mnemonic imagination for talent shows in Britain, but it, but it needed to get there. So there are other shows that do that, like Got, um, Got Talent or Strictly Come Dancing are very much part of the kind of mnemonic imagination for talent shows in the UK now. I mean, they, they're really, really embedded in British popular culture and I think Got to Dance never quite got that moment because but it was generating it um mm -hmm. but it, it you know it got cut off from season five so it was getting a kind of local memory cultures but to have tapped into that kind of national mnemonic imagination for talent shows in the UK it needed to kind of reach it's more like it's ninth tenth season and I think then we would have really seen seen it sort of tapping into that broader um popular cultural memories yeah, uh, but uh, I mean, I, I um, would love to see how embedded engagement can link with with memory, memory practices, contested memories, um, like I said, sort of localized memories. Um, yeah, that'd be kind of really interesting to see. Because um, I think in your case, you are dealing with a commercial brand and a, a kind of commercial world that transcends its its commercial place place marker, if you know what I mean, and yes. become something beyond its economic value. Mm. You know, so it's kind of mem memory values, its family yes. value, um, uh, all, all all become kind of caught up in that, and that takes some real time, doesn't it, to kind of get passed on um, yeah. after people's experiences of going to Disney, the, the Disney World. And having that kind of live experience. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. yeah, it's like I told you, uh, they kind of ritualize it. I don't know if it's everywhere in the world. I don't believe it is. I believe that uh, there are some points in the world, maybe uh, places that are very um, influenced by the, um, the North America culture, especially the US uh, culture, mm -hmm. such as Brazil. And I think we we kind of culturalize this those rituals. Like I, I think I, I, I exemplified to you in the in, the, in our first uh, conversation that um, we have this huge adolescence groups from 14 to 16 years old, more or less, that they go to Disney in this um, in this organized sets because it's kind of a, 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 a rite of passage. So th there are kinds of rituals that are they are getting embedded in our in our lives in our lifetime. Even though we sometimes do not share uh, the same culture, we do not share the same um, ideas of country, of territory, of uh, things like that. So it's kind of this place that is suspended because it doesn't it doesn't actually. It embodies the, the mm -hmm. American way of life in all sorts of ways. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, since it is, um, it's disconnected, it also can be accessed from a lot of places in, around the world. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited to do this, <laughs> to actually mm -hmm. think about uh, your idea throughout memory. Mm -hmm. I, I'm also... I'm also, I also came across um, this idea from, I think it, it's Deus, that, the, that's the name of the, the person. Um, he wrote this, the, this PhD dissertation about the trans, about media life that he tries yes. to theorize. Mark this. Thursday's book, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I actually came across a, a person that uh, used this idea and is talking about transmedia life which I think mm. is the point mm. that I'm doing an intersection between your thoughts and memory and also my, my works with space. So I'm really excited mm. to do that. <laughs> Very interesting set of connections. Yeah. 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 
Okay, so last question. <laughs> From an audience engagement perspective, do you notice any patterns in the combination of cognition and affection that contributes to the longevity, longevity, longevity? <laughs> of a certain media content. And as example, I put it like uh, a content that has a high affection, uh, maybe through child memories or something like that. And uh, is also really cogn cognitively explained it like, oh, it's educational. It has a, a, a sort of a va good values for family and things like that. Did you notice uh, when we were talking, when you were talking with audiences like this kind of, oh, I'm, I really love that, but I love that because like a graduation of, of something that can actually uh, intervene in how long this a certain content live? Mm. Mm. That's a very good question. And I guess you're asking about whether genre or different types of artifacts or events compared to content or aesthetics has an impact on the relations across the affective and cognitive work of engagement. Is that what you're? Yes. To? Yes. Hmm. I think it does make a big difference, but I, st I still see it impossible to. To wait the affect and cognitive work of engagement differently. Uh, mm -hmm. I, think, I think you'll find them with any empirical audience study, you'll find that kind of the, those affective and cognitive sides working all the time. Um, so, but, but the, what the consequences are for that, what, you know, what the values are for it, what the, the, the consequences are for it, I do think it changes radically. Um, that's my dog Oscar saying a little hello <laughs> to the postman. Um, I think it changes radically if you're at a live event, which is, you know, one of the things that you're studying or you're watching uh, something pre-recorded um, as representations um, and also changes, you know, changes very differently with the with the type of genre. So, for example, um, uh, one of the cases that I've looked at with cognitive and affective work is professional wrestling. Right. So. Of engagement, so I've looked at how you um, would go to a live professional wrestling match in in Sweden, um, and how you're engaging um, positively and negatively with the different characters that come into the ring, which is a kind of key, crucial part of professional wrestling is the um, the the intense positive engagement with the the hero and the intense negative engagement with the 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 villain um and of course both are, are um both are things that you do as an audience member you know you need to do both to kind of let let this kind of live event um have a kind of positive experience overall for for, for everybody at the, at the venue so uh you can see people um affectively engaging first you know mm -hmm. and particularly um with the kind of affective structure of the live event the way the performers before they even enter the ring how they're kind of whipping up the crowd particularly the kind of the um the heel whips up the crowd to kind of boo and and uh, shout and spit at them <laughs> before they even get into the ring so you can see the affect the affective side the affective structure <laughs> super important the postman's gone now thank you oscar <laughs> super important to um to how they're engaging you know so affect comes out really clearly and then of course they start um booing and, and shouting and and screaming and jumping up and down so again you know we we get this kind of shift from the affective into the the physical sensation so the emotional um modes of engagement come out really clearly so you know and with with the body right and the and the and the voice so we get all of that, all that comes through, but just as soon as you get a chance to kind of stop and talk to someone about it, oh, so what's going on here? And, you know, I see that, you know, we're watching this match together and how are you identifying with these particular characters? What do you think about these particular moves? Or, you know, like, what do you think about the soap opera storyline or, you know, like whatever. As soon as you start talking to them, the cognitive mode comes in. So it's always there. It's not like, it's not like one override to the other. But the way that we go into the study of the engagement is definitely through noticing as a researcher, the affective, the emotional, the sort of bodily engagement. 
but out comes if you get a chance to interview them um, in the in the live event out comes the the cognitive side of it and the example I used in some things that I've written over the last year or two was um, the use of um, political storytelling in professional wrestling in Sweden so I was studying the use of a, a um, populism storyline by a set of um, wrestlers in Sweden um, it was called breakneck Brexit uh, they had a kind of Brexit theme and the whole point there was to invite <laughs> A kind of left-wing Swedish audience to engage negatively with the right-wing politicians in the ring who would be beaten up and who would lose in every single match you know even if they won one match you knew you would go back the next time so they were physically beaten up <laughs> by wrestlers playing the roles of migrants for example you know wrestlers playing the roles of, of underdog wrestlers playing the role of um, the stereotyping of these particular characters within populism discourses in Sweden. And it was very obvious that the, the wrestlers knew they were inviting audiences to engage first affectively, literally the, the, the subconscious feeling in the ring, then through the use of music, then through the use of inviting people to boo and shout and, and jump up and raise their fists and but to cognitively engage because of course they were making a political point these all these wrestlers were designing these storylines because they were really worried about the rise of populism in sweden and uh, you know and it worked i mean so when we were sort of talking to the audiences through all that kind of political performance <laughs> um that's my dogs agreeing with me um yeah. audiences were saying yeah you know um they're really worried about this and, and they know it's a performance but nevertheless it got a chance a chance for them to for once for once feel yeah. like left-wing politics was winning <laughs> you know yeah. um, it, even if only in the ring only in the drama the political drama of the ring okay. so you could you could design that study so it's only affective and emotion because that's so obvious it's so visible but if you just stop and get people and talk to them in the breaks outside the venue afterwards, on the way home, on the train, you know, I was interviewing people everywhere. They're, then they're talking very much about how they've cognitively engaged with that mm -hmm. um, because of their political concerns, you know, um, yeah. which they can. Yeah, which they which they're aware. Popular culture gives them a, a chance to kind of reflect on that. Um, and how, you know, how that might um, give them some sort of awareness of what they will do with their voting powers or how they might go on social movements, um, you know, uh, in, in Sweden and so sort of protest against the rise of populism. So it's very interesting. Yes. It's a long answer. Sorry, I was thinking it through, actually, um, how to do it with that particular case. But it's, it was a long answer. But I I think you just have to be patient to see both the cognitive and affective work come through in your data design and in your analysis and, ref and um, reflections on the material. Because my instinct is always that those two are intertwined and enmeshed. Um, even if you, you see one going um, more clearly than the other to start with, take time mm -hmm. to, look for, to look for those modes of engagement sort of coming through. Yeah. Yeah, you know uh, this this approach of having all, all uh, having affective and cognitive like intertwined. I remember uh, Danielle Kahneman work, uh, neuroscience from the you know the the one and the two the system the two the system one and the system two and how they works in our brain and i think mm. that is the thing i mean we we actually feel first and then we can actually start thinking about it after but maybe uh, since the difference of one thing and the other is so 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 small um it happens almost simultaneously mm. like we provide rational explanations for our feelings almost instantly when we feel it you know, so yeah. uh, I think it's it's more or less around that, you know, having um, actually feeling and actually thinking about what you're feeling or at least trying to think about what you're feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And often will our motivations for, you know, for for engaging with something will be cognitively driven. Yes. Um, even if then when we're engaging, 
you know, in comes, oh, well, actually, it's emotionally driven as well, you know, or th those two things are mixed together. But yeah, um, certainly in the case of the, the wrestling example, I would say anyone that was following that particular political storyline, which went on for quite a few years, they even had a, a, a live um, wrestling event on, at the time of the Swedish election. So anyone going to that event, your motivations to engage with it would be cognitively first, mm -hmm. But then it'd be very hard to to disentangle that from the sort of the affective and emotional and physical engagement with yeah. the kind of live experience itself, right? Yeah, definitely. And then afterwards, it all gets mixed up again together, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, Annette, thank you so much for your time, for your consideration with, with me, with my, my work. And I would like to give you some time if you want to add something, maybe around what we talked about, or like say something for the Brazilian people that are watching. <laughs> and uh, so just gratitude for, for all this, this kindness of yours. And I hope to actually have other opportunities for us to talk. And I'll definitely send you my, my PhD research if you like to. <laughs> yes, it absolutely. Be, yeah, it will be yeah, available just, in English also. So I would love to hear your thoughts about it. No, well, thank you. I, um, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to craft such lovely questions for me. Um, I felt they were tailor-made <laughs> um, for my research. So thank you for your sort of careful reading and, and very thoughtful and perceptive questions. I think you've got a lot to contribute in terms of the intersections between kind of live, um, live events, the Disney brand, the Disney transmedia story worlds, memories, <laughs> um, you know, um, fan worlds <laughs> that you've <laughs> described and kind of a embedded engagement that sounds kind of a really terrific mix so I look forward to seeing how you sort of put that together um I'm, I mean I'm carrying on uh looking at um engagement so the the next um work that I'm doing now with uh with the scholar Peter Dahlgren we're doing a book for Routledge on media engagement as a sort of key concept so we're defining engagement um as relational as linked to kind of um mm -hmm. power relate as power power relations we're um offering a, a model um for the parameters of media engagement that you can apply which is designed specifically for the this example like i gave for you know um in relation to where the political meets the popular so that that kind mm -hmm. of crossover of sort of um, political spheres and popular cultural spheres, this sort of model works especially for that. And um, we're we're sort of just reaching out to 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 people um, if they if they're aware of studies that link to this, please get in touch and let us know. Um, we're just now at, the, at this point designing a new study um, which will be transnational audiences in Malaysia and uh, um, Vietnam. So we're kind of really interested in the sort of transnational engagement um, and curious to, if people um, who are listening to this have examples of different types of uh, media engagement um, particularly which cross over those spheres particularly from transnational um, contexts we'd love to hear from you definitely um, and other than that the next thing I'm really curious about and want to write about is um, reaction media so um, you know, when we're watching someone else who's engaged with something else, yeah. um, I'm sort of really curious about reaction media um, and uh, just get in touch with examples because I'd love to hear about different examples of that. Yeah, it, it reminded me of a, a very interesting uh, React video that I saw a couple of months ago. Um, it's, a, it's this British guy, he al always reacts to big music videos from all around the world. So people send him like a video that hits more than 1 million views in one week or two days or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he was reacting to this uh, Korean pop group, which is called Blackpink. And mm -hmm. he was watching one of uh, their music videos. And he was like, Oh, I love the fact that they mix Korean with with English and they do that. And and, and then the, he got like a thousands of comments like 
it's amazing how uh, centered uh, people think the English are. And, and then yeah. they started to actually uh, have a conversation about language and language barriers mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So it actually became very interesting. So those React movie uh, uh, videos, I think they are really interesting. I, I, I would love to, hit, to read all of those papers that you were working on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's a re reaction media is a new genre, definitely. Yeah. And it's been around for a long time in radio or in theatre where someone, they can be a, a, an ordinary citizen, but quite often they're a comedian or they're a, they're a performer mm -hmm. in some way anyway, react to something. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, the audience, are reacting to them, reacting to something. And I think it's a really interesting very intense form of the performance of audiencehood yeah so it's very it's very a, intense yeah the reaction yeah. inception <laughs> yeah i mean it's like a hall of mirrors isn't it all the yeah. different reactions and i've seen it in documentary done 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 with a very serious um message i've seen it done in of course uh, comedy i've seen it done in uh, porn <laughs> seen it done in <laughs> podcasting um around yeah. kind of um transmedia story worlds there's a lot there around gaming um music videos you know it's a mm -hmm. it's a very very interesting thing um around digital boredom you know there's kind mm -hmm. of reaction media about people being bored mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. doing nothing you know the art of doing nothing so it's a it's a I, I think it's um it's it's a terrific um it's a terrific new genre that I want to study uh, yeah definitely yeah I don't know if this this channel is still on but it was there was a, a channel on YouTube that it was only a chair like uh, you you saw 24 7 a chair yeah. And sometimes mm -hmm. a person sits there and like keeps staring to the camera, but then, then again, it was the chair. So that was the whole dynamic of the, the channel. And it, it had like more than a million subscribers and things like that. So yeah, we, we are we are in front of a really, really interesting uh, products of media. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. And, uh... Um, yeah, I, I um, sort of open out a call on reaction media, so sort of see what we can find. I'm really excited. The world. I mean, it goes back in Japan, you know, to the 80s with um, some amazing reaction media through sort of television formats like game shows and stuff. You know? So very, very interesting, um, different um, trans-regional interpretations of reaction media, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. Really, really that's interesting. Nice. That's something. That's something. If I um, if I get a chance, that's something I'm going to start working on. Nice. Well, Nat, so thank you again uh, for your time and everything you, else. I'm really glad that I had a chance to talk to you about your work, and I'm really excited to see what's coming next. You're welcome. Thank you so much, and stay in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.